Uh, if you've been wondering over the last several years, how could I ever know more about God's Word and how the Bible fits together? Man, have we got an opportunity for you. That's my sales job, everybody. So next week, we're going to be starting our 30 days uh, to understanding the Bible class. So it's a pretty short book. We're going to work through it together as a group. And if you're thinking about maybe wanting to participate, stop by Sunday at 9 o'clock next week. And that's kind of the trial run. You can come and check it out, see if you're interested. And if you say, this isn't for me right now, no strings attached. But come on out, and we're going to talk about God's Word together. Now, that's kind of the, the announcement that you've got to get out there. And now here's the one that I'm excited about. Right. Nate, would you please come on up here? Give a round of applause for Nate Coons, my friends. For those of you who do not know Nate, Nate interned with us uh, over this summer. He's a boy from South Carolina, so I have it on good opinion that we are the only Great Lakes region of the Wesleyan Church to recruit a kid out of the SEC, so here he is, here, you know, live and in the flesh. Nate's going to be spending two years with us uh, studying ministry, learning all the blocking and tackling of ministry. He's going to be working under Brandon Blair primarily, but you'll also see him working on his preaching and teaching gifts over the next couple years as well, because we've already seen in him the gifts for preaching and teaching, and we know that God's got a bright future for Nate. So Nate, if you don't mind me asking, what would ever possess you to come up to northern Michigan? You said that this is the most snow you've ever seen in your life. What would possess you to make a decision like this one? Well, I should probably say the Holy Spirit. Um, <laughs> What's the real answer? That would be the good church answer, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but that's also the real answer. Um, I really I prayed about it. Um, I felt like over the two months that I was up here, July and August, I really felt connected. I really felt like I belonged in this church. Um, and then to leave so suddenly, so, like, so quickly, it felt like I had been here very short time, so I'm very glad to be back up here. Um, but connecting with Luke, connecting with the staff here, I just really felt led to come back up, um, figure out how to drive in the snow, figure out how to ex exist in this cold weather, um, and stretch myself. Stretch myself in a way that I had actually said to myself multiple times, Oh, I will never move to the north. I cannot tell you how many times those words. He fact, said that. He I, said that this summer. I will never move here. <laughs> I said that when I sat down with you at school. Yeah. I don't like the north. So here I am in the north. <laughs> um, but no, the Holy Spirit really was just prodding me like, this is where you need to be. This is where I've got you. And I'm, I'm really excited for the next two years. It won't be just two months, guys. I'm here for two years. Yeah. So. I'm pumped. Well, and the, and the thing that I wanted to kind of point out to you guys, too, is it is so cool that as a church, we have the opportunity to pour into and to develop young leaders for Jesus' kingdom, all right? It won't be too long before one of your kids or one of your grandkids is up in this role that Nate's pioneering here for us, all right? This is going to be an ongoing thing within our church that we are going to give people opportunities to develop their ministry gifts. And we have a lot of confidence that Nate is going to do a lot of good kingdom work here. And what I want to ask you folks to do is please do everything you can to give Nate a warm Traverse City welcome. All right? He has taken, taken a great sacrifice to come out here and serve and learn with us. All right? He had opportunities right out of college to go do ministry. And he declined those to come out and learn with us and study with us. Okay? So invite him over to your house for dinner. Bake him cookies and bring him in. You know, set him up with eligible young women, you know, I don't, whatever, you know, because uh, we, we love Nate and we want that to kind of to be the, the way that we do things. Um, so Nate, thank you so much for coming up here. We're going to begin our musical worship now. I yeah, uh, really absolutely. appreciate you, man. Thanks appreciate for coming it. up. Just a piece of advice for you, Nate. Don't ever say never to God. <laughs> Because I told him I would never be a worship leader, and here I am. <laughs> would everybody please stand with us? <clears throat> it's a privilege, by the way, to, to be here and worship with you, and I'm so excited for that. So join us enthusiastically. I long for your embrace every single day. this place see you face to face will you 
show me reveal yourself to me because of your mercy I fall down on my knees and I can feel your presence here with me suddenly I'm lost in your beauty caught up in the wonder of your touch here in this moment I surrender to your mountain that is in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you it is well, it is well. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. 
the waves and wind still know his name. The waves and wind still know his name. It is well. Father, we come to you by your Son, Jesus, through your Holy Spirit. We know that our world is troubled right now. We know that members of our own congregation, some have sickness, some have anxiety, some have fears. As your people together, we gather, united as one in prayer. We pray that you will be with the sick. We pray that you will be the visitor with the lonely. We pray for those who are feeling like they're right on the edge of wanting to give up. We pray that you will be their comfort. And we pray that you'll use us to be your hands and feet in all of these situations. God, our Father, we lift up this local congregation to you, as well as the people who are viewing online. We pray that there will be a special move of your Holy Spirit, breaking down walls of resistance and disobedience. And we pray that we will offer you supple hearts, be molded. God, we don't know how to obey you the way that we should. We pray that you will teach us. And we pray most of all that you won't give up on us. God, our Father, we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Be seated, my friends. It's a tender time of 
worship, singing our praises to God. Kids, I want you to know that we love you guys. Thank you so much for being with us. You guys know that you're special? And God loves you guys so dearly, so do we. You guys are excused to go. You got cheers for children's ministry, everybody. That's pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to have our text in just one thing environment. You know we try to do this almost every week. And the whole idea of text in just one thing is to remind ourselves that anybody can go to God's word, draw truth from it, and share it with other people. I think we're knocking on the door about 15 different people that have participated in this. And the gentleman who's going to be doing it today is one that I'm very personally excited about. Pastor Dan Gonder, would you please come up to the front? Pastor Dan comes to us um, by way of, uh, he's uh, from the uh, Methodist denomination originally, he served and worked there. And uh, so in his retirement, he's kind of settled in on the Journey Church as his home church. And he's already been kind of leading in one of our adult ministry environments, hymns and history, along with a couple other uh, excellent leaders. But he's going to read the word for us and then share an insight. And so please, uh, please tune in to what he has for us. I'm pretty excited to hear it myself. Before I begin, I would like to, uh, to thank you. I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the welcome the uh, hospitality and the greeting that Pam and I have enjoyed in this congregation. A year ago, we, we came uh, here to the Journey Church. We didn't know anybody at all, but we came here uh, because I noticed the church on the side of the road. And from the moment that I pulled up into your, dr your parking lot, I dropped Pam off at the door, and before she even got to the door, someone greeted her, offered her hospitality and welcome. When we walked into your door, the door of this church, Pastor Luke greeted us and took time to, to welcome us. And on that first Sunday, there were people of this congregation that gave themselves to us so that we might feel welcome. We came here brokenhearted. I was hurt because the denomination I had grown up in, the denomination that I served as a pastor, had left the true path of God and instead began following the world rather than God's word. And yet when we came here, we, we found a congregation of people that believed and uh, truly believed in God's word and the Holy Spirit. And, and you have led us in the last year. When, when COVID struck, there were people that, in this congregation that reached out to us and let us know that uh, we were important and that we wanted, they wanted us to be a part of this congregation. So I say thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you for the love that you have extended to Pam and I. And I would encourage you in the days coming forth that you would continue to do so, to uh, share that hospitality, share that love, so that others may uh, come to know Christ through this uh, wonderful congregation. This morning I will be reading from Luke chapter 23, Verses 33 through 48. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? 
Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what we, we, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It is now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this is a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to, to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen and amen. Jesus was obedient unto death. He set aside his desire for the will of God. My friends, if you can imagine, Jesus was in the very presence of God. He was in the splendor of heaven. He knew God's plan, God's thoughts. He heard God's words, and there in the beginning, he was there in the beginning. He is God. Yet, Jesus came to us out of his love for humanity, his desire that we could be in relationship with God and to reveal the true nature of God. He came and lived as human and died on the cross. Jesus knows our fears, our frustrations, and the pain that we experience in this life. He came out of love and concern for each of us. Jesus placed his obedience to God before his own desire. So my friends, this morning we have a choice. We can live to please God, to follow God's will. We can choose to live in relationship with the one who created all that we have around us and has given us so much. Or we can live in disobedience, reject God's will. The re religious leaders, the soldiers, and even one of the criminals had little regard for Jesus. They insulted, they even sneered and mocked Jesus on the cross. They gambled for his clothes. While it is easy to follow the will of society, to live in disobedience to God, it is much more difficult to live in obedience and follow the will of God. Mark 7, verses 13 and 14 tell us, teach us, why is the road gate that leads to destruction? Narrow is a road gate that leads to life. Which way will you choose? Like the centurion, we recognize the reality of Jesus. He is our Lord and Savior, the very Son of God. How do we want to live out our daily lives? Shouldn't we live to please God? To live in obedience to God's will? Therefore, let us be thankful. Let us be obedient. Let us be in great thanksgiving for the love, the gift of life that God has given to each and every one of us. Let us celebrate the love of God in our lives and let's go forth in a mighty way to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us set aside our sinful nature and let's embrace Jesus Christ in our hearts. Amen and amen. friend. Thank you, Pastor Dan. It's so encouraging to see. I mean, we've had folks from every generation, and we've had men and women, young people, seasoned ministers, people that have never spoken in public before. Lots of different folks have done this, and what we want to remind you is that 
There's nothing that you see going on here that you can't do. You can go to God's word. You can draw truth from it, and you can share it with the people you know. Okay? So, and I want to do a big uh, thanks to Pastor Dan for re- reading this passage. And so it's very strange, right, to come in to a passage like this. We come in, and I think Pastor Dan said it, in uh, obedience unto death. We come in the middle of a very difficult obedience. And I wonder, as you think about this obedience that Jesus gets called into here, have you ever had a difficult obedience? Have you ever had a difficult obedience? Many people, when they think about this story and they think about Jesus, they just write it off because they say, well, Jesus is God. And so Jesus can do anything. Everything's easy for Jesus. So, and there are some people that really think that Jesus being nailed up on the cross is kind of just like singing jollies and like sipping tea and having a grand old time. Okay. I want to go a little bit behind the scenes. You know, like when you watch a movie, you see like the director's cut where they show you how they put it together. Let's go back in time just a few hours and see what led up to this story. It's found in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. This is a little behind the scenes that we get to see with Jesus and his followers. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. My friends, this is the director's cut where we go behind the scenes and we see that this could be anything but an easy obedience for Jesus. In fact, the passage says that this task overwhelms Jesus. He's sorrowful and troubled. And so sometimes when we make light, well, this is just Jesus. He's the Son of God. I mean, he could take all this and more. We miss the fact that for Jesus, this is a difficult obedience. And when I look at this, it makes me ask myself the question... Would Jesus ever call me into a difficult obedience? Jesus is sacrificing his dignity, his freedom, and his life. The obedience that he's called into here seems to be a different obedience than maybe what we might expect. My friends, you know, I'm trying not to be in the business of throwing rocks or throwing mud at other preachers or other ministries or anything like that. But sometimes when you watch television and you see some of the messages that people preach and teach, it seems to be quite divorced from this story of Jesus. It seems to be like, well, if you send a gift over here, God's going to bless you. If you, you know, are a nice person, then life's going to go well all the time. And you're going to be just, you know, filled with with unicorns and rainbows and bubble machines. and, And you read this obedience that Jesus is called to and you're like, are we talking about the same story? Like, does Jesus get called into this difficult obedience and then you and I, we get called into this easy obedience? The easy obedience in which we do basically whatever we want for however long we want and as much comfort as we want. And we think that it's like, is that the obedience that Jesus calls us all into? 
My friends, one time I was called into a difficult obedience. So I, I moved from Massachusetts to Grand Rapids, Michigan to go to Bible college. All right? I was in the automotive, automotive industry. I was making a fairly good wage for a person who was a high school dropout. I was doing okay. And I come through Bible college and I graduate. I did fairly well academically. But two years after that, I found myself being a custodian at a college. All right? And so I'm cleaning 10 to 15 toilets a day, cleaning a lot of carpet, my bachelor's degree proudly posted in my apartment. And I'm going to be honest, like, I like being a janitor. I'm not throwing janitors under the bus. But I was like, why did I move out here to take on student debt to clean toilets with my degree hanging on the wall? Like, I could have done this where I was at. Like, I didn't need to leave my better paying job to come do this here. It was a time of a difficult obedience. I was like, I thought like if you follow God's will, that that means that life's going to go great and you're going to be happy and you're going to have everything you want and things will be wonderful. Have you ever been called into a difficult obedience before? Jesus faces difficulty in this story, right? We hear this passage, we, he faces great difficulty. He's suffering. He's sorrowful. He's feeling desperate. That's the language that we see here. Jesus faces difficulty, and this is due to his human frailty, right? People sometimes, when they think about Jesus, they think about, well, he's God, so everything's easy for him. But what we see from the passage is that Jesus doesn't shield himself from the struggles and the trials and the woes that you and I suffer from. He enters into them and he lives them. So Jesus faces difficulty due to his human frailty. I once preached a message in which I said, is Jesus more Superman or is he more Batman? Like, you know, like Superman, you can go to Superman, you shoot him right in the chest and he doesn't care, right? Like the only way you can hurt Superman is by hurting people he cares about. Is that the story? Or is he more like Batman? When you put a gun to his chest, you pull the trigger, he's dead. Like, it looks like the passage is kind of saying that Jesus is more of a Batman superhero. Where, like, he feels the pain. He feels the struggles. That's much more the story that we see here. Right? And that's going to be kind of troubling for us. Because look at what Jesus is going to tell us next. We're in Matthew chapter, we were in 26. We're going to go back a couple chapters to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. You guys ready for it? You're not going to like this. No, I don't. It's from Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples. This is before he's, before he's killed, by the way. Before he's crucified. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? My friends, a lot of people and a lot of self-help books that you read will try to communicate to you that your obedience to Jesus is going to guarantee some kind of life in which you're going to be healthier than average, wealthier than average, your relationships are going to go better than average, and everything's going to go great. But I, don't, I can't reconcile that with what I see here. Can you? Where Jesus says, take up your cross. Like the thing they're going to nail me to, the thing they're going to they're gonna nail me to this piece of wood out in the desert and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die of this gruesome death. Jesus' invitation doesn't seem to come with any private jets. It doesn't seem to come with any vacation homes. The invitation is to come die with him. Has this ever Has this ever been communicated to you before? Like, I look at this sacrifice that Jesus does, and I begin to realize, like, he's just a guy like you and me. Like, yeah, he's the son of God, but he's not sheltering himself. He's going Batman on this, and he's taking it right on the chin. And then he says to you and me, he says, anyone who wants to be a disciple. Listen, these are his words. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves 
and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus, we know he faces difficulty due to his human frailty. But when we read this passage and we say that he's going to like invite us into this too, there's a problem, friends. Like, we know that Jesus is more the Batman. Like, we know he's kind of just a guy, but he's got human frailty, like what you and me have. Like, he gets thirsty and he gets hungry. And if you beat him up, like, he's going to bleed from that. Like, that's all true. So Jesus has human frailty like you and I have. But can we be honest with each other here that we're a little weaker than Jesus is? Right. We preached a message several, several months ago now where we talked about this term named sarx. You remember sarx? So sarx is the Greek word that's translated as flesh. Right? And you remember, so when we say flesh, we mean three things. Flesh means like this, if you pinch yourself right in the hand, you're like this skin that you see right here. Like the part of you that's going to die. The part of you that's not permanent. Right? That's the first uh, that's the first definition of Sarx. The second definition is your psychological weakness. You know, like when you set your mind to do something and you're like, I'm going to like get better at going to the gym. I'm going to like watch my diet. I'm going to be nicer to that person I really like. And then you get like 20% of the way in there and you just give up. Maybe you guys don't do that. I do that. About, about half the time I go to the gym and run, I, do, I just bail on my run early, guys. Like, it's a psychological weakness, right? That psychological weakness. And the third is our inclination. The third definition is our inclination towards sin. Our inclination to do the destructive thing, to feed ourselves, right? That's what the sarx is. So Jesus had the part of flesh that's like going to perish, and, but he didn't have the psychological weakness and he didn't have the spiritual inclination towards darkness. So if Jesus is overwhelmed by the task of going to the cross, how are like you and I supposed to do that? Because we're weaker than Jesus. We still have a sarx. We still have this flesh, this psychological weakness, and this inclination towards evil. We still have that. Turn with me to John chapter 17. In verse 1. Jesus is looking down the barrel of his crucifixion. It's coming soon. Listen to what he says. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Listen to this. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I'm going to be curious that the way God's going to glorify him is by him dying on a cross. That's interesting. Verse 6. For I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. He's still speaking to God the Father. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they... No, now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. Listen to Jesus. He's talking to God the Father. We're getting the inside scoop on how Jesus talks to God. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, listen to the words of Jesus for you, for the disciples. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that you may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them. And kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Listen to Jesus. I am coming to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. 
I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may truly be sanctified. My friends, the word gets worse and worse and worse. Jesus says, while I was there with these disciples, I protected them, and now I'm going away. So my friends, Jesus is called into this difficult obedience. We look at it and we say, we're not that good. Like, we can't follow that obedience. And then we learn that, and actually it turns out it's worse because we're weaker than Jesus is. And then he says, I'm going away. So the one, one that was protecting us, like he's leaving and he's praying to God that we would be protected. Why? As the passage says, we're targeted by the world and we're targeted by the evil one. He prays that we'll be protected from the world and by the evil one. So not only are we called into this difficult obedience, we're not as strong as he is. He's leaving and we've got a world and an evil one that are targeting us. Is anybody feeling a sense of anxiety? Right, like our Sarks has general human weakness. Like we're generally weak, but maybe if you're like me, you have some unique weaknesses. Some weaknesses that are unique to you. Anybody have weaknesses that are unique to you? Like generally, like when we get cut, we bleed. If we go hungry for too long, we die. Like we've got our general weakness. But I seem to have like a special set of weaknesses as well. Maybe, maybe for you, it's Oh, I don't know. Maybe you really need people to like you all the time. And so if people like you, they can get you to do just about anything. Maybe that's a weakness you have. Maybe you've got a weakness where the whole world could burn and you're fine with that because like you've got your split kit and you're ready to go. Like I'm independent and I don't need anybody. Maybe that's your weakness. What's your weakness, friends? Like we've got our general human weakness, but we also have our unique weaknesses. And we are targeted, right? Jesus is praying that we'll be protected from the world and we'll be protected from the evil one. It's because they're gunning for us, y'all. I, I hang out with Nate too much. That's why I say y'all now. I didn't have that before. It's a new trick I learned. And Jesus, this passage says, he calls us to follow him into death. There's this difficult obedience that we're called into here. Like, I thought I was fine being a Christian, being a Christ follower, when I thought it meant like my life was going to go good. But you're saying you want me to follow you into death? That's an ask too big. I'm not that strong. I'm not that good. It gets worse, too. Because it's not just that like he calls us to follow us, follow him into death, but like we're supposed to be continuously improving as we go. Look at the words of Jesus. All right, so we're in John chapter, right there in 17, verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them. Remember what sanctify means? Sanctify means become more like Jesus. Become more set apart. Become more holy. So, like, Jesus doesn't even want you to, like, it's, yeah, it's great that you, like, agreed to the difficult obedience and you're willing to die. But, like, that's not even enough. Like, you got to get better as you do it. My friends, this difficult obedience that we're called into, Jesus calls us to follow him into death. But we resist the Holy Spirit in difficult obedience. We resist the Holy Spirit in difficult obedience. My friend, Jesus once said, he said to a group of his friends, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you've grown up in the United States, the very poorest people that we have today in the United States are wealthy 
by the world's standards, particularly throughout history. Humans spent thousands of years almost starving to death all the time. Like, if you're an American, that passage applies to you. That passage applies to me. That came from Jesus. Like, that wasn't one of his buddies. That was Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. My friends, there are many among us, and I think I'm probably at risk of this myself, that we don't really want to follow Jesus into the difficult obedience because we value our comfort, we value our wealth, we value our relationships, we value our habits more than we value chasing Jesus down this death wish that he seems to have for us. My friends, we resist the Holy Spirit when he calls us into difficult obedience because we feel like we have something better. We have our five senses. We can delight our eyes. We can delight our ears. We can delight our sense of taste. We can delight our sense of touch. We can delight all our senses. And we choose that over the difficult obedience that Jesus calls us into because we think it's better. We think it's better. But Jesus calls us into this obedience and says, I'm going to lay all of that on the line. And he invites us to take up our cross and follow him. Friends, how do we do that? How do we do that? I know that I'm going to be voted on in six or seven months about whether I get to stay here as your pastor. So I think I'm going to blow all those opportunities to the wind with what's coming next. Like, so Jesus calls us to pick up our cross daily and follow him into this death that he's calling us into. But if I look at my behavior and I look at my actions, I see very little of truly sacrificial living. And I think it goes worse the longer I go. Like, remember when I said, like, I left home in Massachusetts and moved to a state and town where I didn't know anybody because I thought God was calling me to it? And I sold everything that didn't fit inside a navy green duffel bag. I fit all of my earthly possessions in that, and I moved to Michigan with just that. And now I've got a house with bedrooms and a couple cars, and i got a shop in the garage, and i got stuff, and i got plenty of food, and i got all... It seems like the longer I go, the worse it goes. Can anybody else relate to that? When you think about, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, do you feel like you're living more sacrificially now than you were a year ago? How about, how about 10 years ago? Is it going better or is it going worse? Are you living more sacrificially or are you living less? Are you picking up your cross more or are you picking it up less? My friends, right here in America, and this is the one people are going to get mad at about. It is so easy to cash your chips in and just coast the rest of your life. You can very safely and very ably, if you have any set of skills, you can work a job. If you do the right thing with your money, you can retire and you can spend the rest of your life keeping yourself, your exterior body temperature at 83 degrees for the rest of your life. You can retire and go down the warm parts of the country in the winter months and be up here in the summer months and you can never serve God again for the rest of your life. Are some of us doing that? Are some of us living our little slice of heaven and rejecting Jesus' call into a difficult obedience because of how comfortable our lives are? I know as I say these words, I convict myself. Like, this isn't a a me-at-you-guys type of thing here. But my friends, like, where did we think that when we turned a certain age, we got to just cash all our chips in and just spend the rest of our lives pleasing ourselves and no longer serving the Lord? When did we ever think that was okay? Young people, when did we ever get to a spot where we thought, well... I'll have the rest of my life to serve the Lord, but right now it's important for me to live for me. 
When did, we, when did we think that it was okay for us to set down the cross and start following our sarks instead of sacrificially following Jesus into the lion's den? My friends, that narrative about young people live for the now, retired folks, live for your flesh, you can do that and nobody's going to say boo to you. Because they just say, well, if I don't say anything to them about theirs, they won't say anything to me about mine. And as long as we all pretend that everything's okay, as long as we pretend everything's okay, I can, I can live in my sense of security. And I can live in my comfort. And I can call myself a Christian, but never actually sacrificially follow Christ at all. Is that true for any of us? I know it grows, seems to grow increasingly true for me every year. The longer I live, the more comfortable I get and the more settled I become. My friends, did you know that once you get to a certain age, you can just retire and everybody will give you a pass? Yeah, they did their time. They're good. They're just going just gonna to retire and sail off into the sunset. Young people, do you know that people will give you a pass to make terrible mistakes right now? Because they, oh, they're young. They don't know any better. You can totally live for your flesh and nobody's going to say anything to you about it. Nobody will say a word. Because we all have this like, this, like mutual destruction pact, right? Like, I don't say anything about yours. You don't say anything about mine. And between all of us, we can just none of us live sacrificially. We can just none of us follow Christ. Because for whatever reason, we think that our five senses will do a better job of pleasing us than following Jesus into the lion's den. We resist the Holy Spirit in difficult obedience. We're called to be sanctified, to become more like Jesus. We're called to become more sacrificial and not less. Do you feel more sacrificial? Reminded of that we're on the Batman kicker. Remember see, when you see Bane, where this guy goes, I'm in charge here. And Bane goes, do you feel in charge? Like, do you feel more sacrificial than you did a year ago, 10 years ago? Are you following Christ into the lion's den? Do you really believe that this world has more to offer you than Christ does? The way we behave sure looks like it. And my friends... Even as I say these words, your inclination may be to dig deep and say, well, then I just need to try harder. I just need to do more. I just need to prove to Pastor Luke or to other people that are looking that I've got things figured out. My friends, that's not going to get it done. This is a work of God from beginning to end. It's a work of the Trinity, a work of God in Trinity that's going to get us there. Let's look back at the passage. Okay, Listen to the prayer of Jesus. Go to verse 13. I'm coming to you now. Jesus says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I'm calling them into the lion's den and they're going to get my joy along the way. And Jesus seems to think this is a fair trade. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My friends, do you think the world has more to offer you than God does? Verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. When we get saved, God doesn't just, doesn't just transport us to heaven, does he? No, we stay here. Why? Why? My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. My friends, the reason you're still here, the reason why when you put your trust in Jesus for the first time, he didn't just transport you directly to heaven, is because you're part of a kingdom mission. Jesus dies on the cross, right? And he calls us into this sacrificial living with him. Why? Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. 
My friends, the longer we walk with Christ, the more sacrificial our life becomes, not less. Young people, we don't live for today. We don't live to satisfy our flesh. We don't get away with the excuse, well, nobody's going to point their finger at you because you're young and you're allowed to make mistakes. My senior friends, you don't get to retire. If you're going down to Arizona and Florida every winter, you better be on mission. There better be people who you're pouring into. There better be disciples that you're making. There better be cashiers at the grocery stores that you're sharing your faith with. There better be people that you're serving. My friends, God's work goes everywhere. I'm not saying don't go to Florida or don't go to Arizona. You understand this? I'm saying wherever you're going, you're on mission. You're called to live a sacrifice. That's the calling that we have on ourselves, that God's given to us. And he says that when we do this, we get his joy. We get his joy. It's better than what the world has to offer. My friends, how many of you, how many of us have lived a life in which we tried to please ourselves? How good did it go? Did you ever get to the bottom of it? Did you ever say that was enough? Did you ever see the world's really doing a good? No, the world can't offer us. It can't offer us the joy that comes from God. And so instead, we're called into this work of God in Trinity in us. Because you and I, we have general human weakness. But Jesus promises to resurrect us in new bodies. You have unique weaknesses just like I do, right? He says the Holy Spirit will empower us to overcome that. You might be targeted by the world, but Jesus has prayed to the Father and he's going to shield us from the world. We're targeted by the evil one. But Jesus prayed that we'd be protected by the evil one. My friends, it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to overcome. We're going to have resurrected bodies just like Jesus. Jesus has prayed that God the Father will shield us from the world and protect us from the evil one. My friends, the whole Trinity is wrapped around us growing and our ability to sacrificially love this world to which we're called. And God is doing his work in you. He has promised to resurrect your body. To empower you to overcome, shield you from the world, protect you from the world. Have you lost your way? Are you taking advantage of his grace right now? Are you grown cold? Have you forgotten your oath to follow Christ? God calls us into a difficult obedience, my friends. Have you, like I have, let soft, comfortable living take you out of the game sometimes? Older Christians, have you retired from the ministry? Younger Christians, have you been distracted by the world and by temptation? We're called into a difficult obedience and the whole Trinity is wrapping its arms around helping us to step into that obedience. Let's pray. God, your words are so hard on us. We're wired, everything in us is wired to seek comfort, to seek the easy way. We can't help ourselves. Lord, if we've retired early, if we've gotten soaked into the world and its temptations, we pray that you'll forgive us and that we will turn around and begin following your son Jesus into the sacrificial living that he's calling us into. God, our Father, we repent to you for living selfish lives, for comforting our senses and our flesh rather than accepting the joy that you offer, the joy that you give. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who walks into this difficult obedience and shows us the way. Do it by the Holy Spirit. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand, my friends. If you're viewing this online or if you're here in person, these are hard words. Uh, we all have our general weakness and our specific weaknesses. But God is so good. He's so good and his will and his desire is for you that you will live victoriously and overcome the world. Receive this blessing from God. 
May you go into this world being shining lights to the world. May you live on fire for Christ and experience all of his joy. I pray these things over you in the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, my friends. Thank <laughs> you.